everybody. Um, very warm welcome to South Africa. Um, my name is Christopher Tinley, and I'm head of pediatric ophthalmology, a, a department in a, one of the largest children's hospitals in Africa. And I'd be delighted to share my experiences of pediatric uveitis with you. So let's get started. Okay, so to be quite honest, most of us are very fearful of, or at least frustrated by pediatric uveitis, mainly because there's so many unanswered questions. Really, the only certainty is uncertainty. And traditionally, the prognosis for children with pediatric uveitis was dismal, even blinding in 40%. But perhaps we can reach enlightenment possibly using a systematic multidisciplinary approach. Back to the contents of this webinar. So we're gonna talk about uveitis in children in general, and then look at recent consensus statement guidelines, as well as touch on uveitic cataract for a little while and explore some new frontiers. So to start off with uveitis in children in general, well, it seems it's not a, a disease peculiar to humans and that animals can get it too. And this is a picture of a cat with uveitis. In our unit, we looked at the spectrum of non-infectious uveitis managed um, in our pediatric rheumatology department over the last few years. And we didn't find a huge number. Uh, we had an equal number of girls and boys. Um, the mean age, median age at the first visit was six years. And in total, 6% of all our JIA patients have uveitis. Of those who had associated diseases, 43% had JIA, of which the lion's share was oligo -JIA. However, we have a large proportion of idiopathic uveitis as well, which are particularly frustrating to manage. Sarcoidosis, HIV-related, and post-streptococcal syndrome make up the minority. So at Red Cross, we're very fortunate to have a multidisciplinary team to co-manage these patients. We have combined clinics on Tuesday afternoons. Um, the ophthalmology appointment is first, and then the patients move on to see the rheumatologists. We keep continuation sheets of patient data in the, in the clinical folder. Um, and we look after routine blood tests, check blood results, and do rheumatological, rheumatological checks if necessary. Thankfully, um, the motivation for, bi for biological agents and the planning of infusions is done by our rheumatology colleagues, and we're very grateful for that. However, we work in a financially constrained health system, so there's a limit on, on funding for our biological agents. So we have to be very um, targeted as as far as who we can prescribe them to. This is a, um, a copy of the spreadsheet, the continuation sheet we use for each visit. So we enter all the patient's data um, for the day down these columns, including what bloods have been done and what follow-up is necessary, and that, as well as the treatment plan here. So let's talk about uveitis in JIA in general. So we know that Children at risk are those who have a younger onset, younger age of onset, those who are ANA positive, girls, and children with oligo JIA. However, we also know that boys do get it as well, as well as ANA negative patients and polyarticular and psoriatic and emphases related. And no lab findings consistently define a discrete pattern of disease. So how do we go, go about screening in JIA? Well, there's a lot of confusion surrounding this. Americans have several complicated guidelines and they don't seem to be able to reach a consensus on what uh, to do with JIA screening. The British are simpler, thankfully, and they have come up with a consensus statement um, which includes all JIAs, which are screened four monthly until they're 11 years old. And they feel that the aim not changed the risk sufficiently to determine the screening policy. 
And we know that in children that present with uveitic um, eye disease, often they are asymptomatic, and this makes it particularly um, difficult to pick up at an early stage, hence the, the need for screening. Occasionally, they do present with red eyes, photophobia, um, peripheral, uh, sorry, posterior synechiae, and abnormal pupils, um, and corneal clouding if there's a glaucoma issue or visual impairment. If the eye is painful, it often points to an infective etiology or a reactive one, such as post-streptococcal uveitis, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, in a young child with uveitis, they may present just with unusual blinking or eye rubbing, whilst visual inattention, preferential attention to auditory signals, or a new onset squint. So be on the lookout for that. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide because it's important um, in the management of these children. So the nomenclature for uveitis grading changed a f uh, about a decade ago, and it's important because you need to be able to compare your findings from one visit to the next. And in order to do this, you need to be able to use all your superpowers to make sure that the child is comfortable and relaxed for the examination of the anterior chamber. So I usually do this by letting the child sit on the mother or the father's lap and, and try if at all possible to get the child um, to rest their chin on the slit lamp so you can do a proper slit lamp, slit lamp examination. And then what I do is I turn all the room lights out, so off, so that the room is completely dark and then sit with my slit lamp looking at the anterior chamber and just waiting there for 10 or 15 or even 20 seconds to see if I can start see cells circulating in the anterior chamber. But it's important to have the room lights dark and all doors closed. At our unit, our routine uveitis workup includes an autoimmune screen, some infectious serology, namely syphilis, toxoplasma, and post-streptococcal, as well as an HIV test, chest X-ray, and a full rheumatological review. I just want to touch on this entity called post-streptococcal syndrome uveitis, which we see occasionally in our unit. Typically, it presents with an acute uni or bilateral anterior uveitis with a hypopian. <clears throat> and when you do serology, you'll see very raised ASO titers if the child has had a throat infection or anti-B beta DNA titers if the child had a re recent skin infection. Um, but it usually responds well to standard treatment protocols, but often recurs when the child is exposed to streptococcal antigens again. It's unclear whether penicillin plays a role in the management of these, of these children and whether a, tons a tonsillectomy removes a reservoir of streptococcus, which prevents rec recurrences. More commonly, however, when, it, when a child presents with uveitis, it's not typical of the post-streptococcal syndrome and is more likely to be atypical. But if you find that your streptitis are raised, then you're not quite sure what to make of them because they could be incidental just because a child has a, an incidental throat or skin infection. We very rarely see infective uveitis in our, in our children. We have the occasional toxoplasma. Uh, Toxocara crops up occasionally, um, but it's a clinical diagnosis for us because in South Africa, the lab testing for Toxocara antibodies is no longer available. This year, I've seen quite a few um, children with T TB uveitis, namely an anterior scler scleritis, a huge iris nodule, these are all different children, and two children with posterior uveitis. And most of them were confirmed with very, very strongly positive uh, tuberculin skin tests. <clears throat> but if you have a, an infective cause for uveitis, it makes life easier for us in a, in a sense because we treat them as per infectious disease protocols. And usually they, they respond well. It's the chronics and the idiopathics that give us headaches. So here's a picture of uveitis in a, in a rabbit, um, an associated cataract. So how do we treat JIA-related uveitis? And this is a template that I'm going to share with you, which 
I also find useful in, in extrapolating to all children with uveitis, especially the idiopathic group. But hopefully um, you have access to a pediatric rheumatologist or rheumatologist who can help you with the management of the systemic management of children with uveitis because it can be very complicated for ophthalmologists um, to manage on their own. Um, the paper I want to specifically talk about is a consensus statement that came out in the seminars of arthritis and rheumatology in, uh, in 2019. And it gives you a very nice stepwise algorithm on how to manage these, these children. So the aim of, of treatment in children with active uveitis is to eliminate all anterior chamber activity. So you should not be able, to, you should not be happy seeing any cellular activity in the anterior chamber. So phase one is to institute topical steroid therapy. And these need to be potent topical steroids. Two hourly while awake, or even hourly if there's a lot of anterior chamber inflammation and then keep them controlled with ointment at night and do that intensively for the first few days <clears throat> and then taper over six weeks according to the response. Use cycloplegics to prevent or break posterior synechia and in chronic inflammation, consider trypicamide at night. Just be careful in the unilateral uh, uveitis, dilating the pupil if they're in the amblyogenic age group. So what happens if there's no inactivity on more than two drops per day after three months? Because then you run the risk of developing topical steroid related cataract and glaucoma. But what happens if there's a reactivation once you taper the topical steroids or if you have new inflammation related complications? Well then we have to start disease modifying drugs like methotrexate. In smaller children, the absorption is adequate if you give it orally, but in, in bigger children, we have to use a subcut dosage once a week and, and, and give it associated folate weekly as well. Prior to commencing um, these medications, you need to rule out any underlying liver disease, specifically if you're going to use methotrexate. And if you're planning on biologicals, you have to exclude underlying infection like tuberculosis, etc. It's recommended that vaccinations be completed more than four weeks prior to commencing the treatment. And critical is to ensure monitoring um, and that there's a, there is adequate place for, com um, for monitoring of compliance um, and infections or malignancy as a result of these immunosuppressive therapies. And that's where our pediatric rheumatologists are exceptionally helpful. Occasionally, we reach the stage where after four months of methotrexate and topical steroids twice a day, there is still no inactivity or reactivation or new complications, in which case now is the time to add a TNF-alpha antibody. And the one we we prefer to use is adalimumab or Humira as it's a humanized antibody and use a smaller dose in, in smaller children and a high dose in children who are heavier. And it's a two weekly subcutaneous uh, administration. Um, an alternative to that is infliximab. But this, the downsides of this is that it has to be administered under an intra intravenous infusion um, two to eight weekly, but it can be very useful if you're worried about compliance of children and whether the, the Humira is actually being administered correctly at home. We know that methotrexate needs to be used in combination with biologicals, as this reduces the risk of drug neutralizing antibodies. If you can't afford biologicals, then azathioprine is a useful alternative or if biologicals are contraindicated or ineffective. The consensus group advised against the use of cyclosporin A, mycophenolate, and etanercept in JIA uveitis. And sulfasalazine is only used in HLA-B27 associated uveitis. So 
very occasionally, and if you're very unlucky, you still don't get a remission after four months of biological agents, in which case you have a few options. You can either increase the dose of the biological or reduce the interval between doses, or you can switch between anti-TNF agents. Alternatively, you can use a different biological targeting a different chemical um, cytokine, like tocilizumab or abathocept or rituximab. <clears throat> rituximab has been associated with immune-related reactions and so often has to be administered with caution with um, steroid or antihistamine cover. Systemic steroids are recommended as a bridging therapy only. So when you have severe anterior chamber inflammation, a dense botrytis, maculedema, or hypotony, and then you can use either <clears throat> an oral steroid pulse or an intravenous steroid pulse. We often use the intravenous steroid pulse in our, in our setting. So use 10 to 30 milligrams per kilogram um, per day for three days, and you admit the child to a unit, and in the meantime, you can get all your um, uveitis investigations done if it's a, a child who's presenting for the first time. We all know that steroids have very toxic side effects, and I won't go into those in detail, but they should be used systemically with caution. Periocular steroids have a, a useful role to play as a form of rescue therapy if all else fails, especially if the disease is unilateral. And you can give it subconjunctival, orbital floor, or intraocular. And the steroids recommended are triamcinolone or dexamethasone. And these are associated with fewer systemic side effects. However, you have to consider that anesthetic will be required and you can develop problems with glaucoma and cataract. Often children respond to steroids with IOP spikes. If, it, if you find a child um, intraocular pressure is spiking due to the, the steroids, then rather treat the, the intraocular pressure spike than reducing the anti-inflammatory medication. And I often think of uveitis as like playing a game of, ch of chess. You make one move and then you wait for the disease to respond. So it's important to, to change the medicines or just a dose, just one at a time, because otherwise it's difficult to gauge the effect of, of changing um, each move. A lot of people are, are concerned about using prostaglandin analogs in uveitis, but generally speaking, they're okay to use. Be careful in children who have had complicated cataract surgery or in AFAX. Just a word about other steroids um, alternatives. Fluoromethylone does not penetrate well into the anterior chamber and therefore has no place in the treatment of uveitis. Be careful about using alpha-GAN or bromododine in children less than five years of age, as this can lead to apnea, hypertension, and somnolescence. Also, it's important to remember that there is very little evidence for the use of topical steroids in uveitis. And often we think we can control the inf inflammation by, by non-steroidal agents when this is really not the case. If you have managed to get a remission with whatever step or stage of treatment you've um, decided upon, you need to consider at a period of at least two years before you can start de-escalating treatment. Two years of inactivity before you can start uh, de-escalating treatment. However, because biologicals are so new, new to the uh, treatment armamentarium, there's very little data to support, support the abrupt or gradual dose reduction of these agents. What we often do is we stop increasing the dose according to the child's weight gain with, with age, or we prolong the intervals between the biological treatments. Remember, when, you, when you're starting to wean the child off biologicals, it's, it's incredibly important to do regular ophthalmic screening to see if the child flares up again. So now we're going to touch on 
some pearls and pitfalls of uveitic cataract. So this is a uveitic cataract in a horse. So how do you go about doing cataract surgery in children with um, uveitis? Obviously we do a lensectomy, but whether to implant an IOL or not remains controversial. There is some evidence to suggest that we should only insert an IOL if the suppression of inflammation can be guaranteed. And that's not always possible in developing countries. Some people suggest you do a lensectomy and a plantar vitrectomy, but only if there's posterior segment involvement on B-scan. In our unit, we're quite aggressive with, with our surgery and do a past plantar vitrectomy, lensectomy, capsulectomy, and we trim cyclitic membranes if we see them um, intraoperatively. Some of you may be lucky enough to have a UVM, in which case you can probably visualize cyclitic membranes before you go in, but we don't have that luxury. So we do it um, in this manner. It's difficult to know how aggressive you need to be in infected uv uveitis, however, because it's an acute etiology and you wouldn't expect chronic inflammation to persist um, after the infection has been treated. However, I have been caught out in the past by doing a lensectomy and inserting an intraocular lens in a child with toxicaria uveitis, and she developed chronic inflammation after that, and I haven't been able to, to get her off topical steroids. So there may be <clears throat> um, an element of the fact that an infected eye is primed to, to be, become inflamed afterwards, even though the infection has resolved. Here are some quotes from a consultant in the UK called Clive Edelston, who's very experienced in the management of children with pediatric cataract. He says, a single aphakic amblyopic eye rarely adds to visual function, but failing to quickly remove a rapidly forming unilateral cataract during the first years of life will not only produce amblyopia, but also prevent adequate monitoring of posterior segment disease. The family should be informed that in some circumstances, all one can aim for is an eye of normal appearance. IOLs are very easy to put in, but extremely difficult to take out. JIA uveitis is an inflammation like no other. With high rates of IOL cocooning, posterior synechiae and membrane formation. And the drawbacks of aphakia can be trivial compared to the profound visual loss that may result from complications of IOL implantation. So in our setting, we do a lensectomy, capsulectomy and PPV. Um, if cyclitic membranes are present, um, they are trimmed. Perioperatively, we use systemic steroids, one milligram per kilogram, which is started a week before the surgery. And then we taper them off only after a month. And this is over and above all the other steroid sparing agents that the child may be on. And then it's important to review the child regularly um, post-op, as well as to keep the pupil dilated. Sometimes we give intravitreal steroids as well, but I prefer to use just systemic steroids post-op. So let's explore some new frontiers um, as far as the future management of uveitis is concerned. So this last picture is of a, of a dog who's got a terrible uveitis with hyperopia. We are beginning to learn that there are several cytokines which, which drive uveitic inflammation. Um, over and above the TNF-alpha um, cytokine, the S100 um, and IL interleukins, which have been responsible for generating UV, the uveitic cascade. We are only beginning to learn more about the role of the intestinal microbiome in ocular inflammatory disease. We know there's a community of microorganisms and all of its genetic material which live inside of us. And these actually outnumber mammalian cells by 10 to 1. And they live in our GITs. And we are learning that there is an association between intestinal dysbiosis and immune system derangement, such as multiple sclerosis, 
ankylosing spondylitis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Certain bacterial strains can promote T helper cell differentiation in the gut and can be highly associated with autoimmune diseases such as uveitis. And interestingly, a fecal microbial transplant has shown to be curative in resistant Clostridium colitis in, a, in large clinical trials. However, there are unique challenges in defining healthy or appropriate donors. We are beginning to learn about the notion of a gut-eye axis and that alternate, uh, altering the intestinal microbiome with antibiotics can severely re reduce uveitis in mice. And some bacterial metabolites can also reduce the severity of uveitis. In a case control series of chronic posterior uveitis, those with uveitis were shown to have significantly increased populations of Fusobacterium and Enterobacteriaceae in their guts. However, it's quite difficult to prove a cause and effect. However, this is food, further food for thought. So in summary, we've explored uveitis in children in general. We've had a look at the recent consensus agreement guidelines, namely first stage topical steroids, second methotrexate, third biological agents, specifically adalimumab and infliximab, and then rescue biological agent, agents if the first line don't, don't, aren't effective. We've also had a look at the pearls and pitfalls of uveitic cataract surgery, as well as explored some new frontiers. So I think the ending is happy. We really are what we eat. And thankfully, many unanswered questions are now being answered. The prognosis is also improving for children with uveitis, with far fewer ending, ending with blinding disease. And it's critical to have a simple, practical, and multidisciplinary approach. Many thanks. So the first question is, how do you manage or extra, extra step in managing uveitis cataract? Would you advocate intracameral dexamethasone injection at the end of the surgery. I tend not to give um, intracameral dexamethasone. Um, however, my UV decatrics are usually um, managed by our vitri pediatric vitreo retinal colleagues, and they sometimes give an intravitreal dose. Um, but I prefer to give to cover the children with systemic steroids rather than rather than giving intraocular steroids. The second question is, how do you manage cases who present with late hypotony and 360 degree peripheral anterior segment, peripheral anterior synechia? So that's an interesting question. Um, by implying 360 degree PAS, you're saying that it's, um, they have closed angles. So do you mean closed angle glaucoma, or do you mean hypotony? I think once you've got hypotony, then you're really on a, on a losing wicket, and it's going to be very difficult to rescue an eye uh, when you have hypotony and 360 degree PAS. So that's a difficult one. Okay, the next question is, when would we stop screening or follow up for JRA, JRA associated uveitis in two clinical scenarios? First, a child without signs of uveitis in multiple visits. Okay, in this scenario, if you have uh, no signs of, of uveitis in a child with JRA, you have to continue screen screening them four months, four monthly until they're 11 years old, and then you can stop screening. But you can't, you can't um, be reassured by the fact that um, there haven't been any signs in the past. The second part of that question is a child with a history of um, JRA associated uveitis who has been stable without treatment for a considerable period of time. So the child has had uveitis in the past, but has been stable without treatment for a considerable period of time. It'll be interesting to know what age group of child you, you're thinking of in this question, but um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, you should you should monitor them for at least two years before 
um, before considering um, um, forgetting about um, screening and monitoring. So the next question is, is there a need of parental, parent, parental, parental treatment for uveitis? Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by parenteral. Do you mean oral steroids or intravenous steroids? If you mean, if, you, if you're talking about intravenous st um, steroids, then there is definitely a place for that. And especially when you're worried about a child with, with acute uveitis or at first presentation when they're presenting with complications, then I often admit the child for a three day um, intensive intravenous um, prednisone or methylprednisone um, pulse. So it does have a role to play, definitely. So HLA B27 anterior uveitis is anterior uveitis, which is associated with some of the spondarthropathies like ankylosing spondylitis. And if you have HLA if you test it for HLA B27 and they're positive, then you know that this is most likely the cause of the uveitis and you can manage it as such. And usually it requires um, rheumatological intervention and investigation for underlying rheumatological diseases. Okay, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you've asked this question. Do you prefer portable slit lamp in cell detection? Uh, because it's often very difficult to look at the anterior chamber in very weakly busy children. Um, I find the, the, the um, slit lamp chair the best form or the best way of examining children for anterior uveitis. But as I said before, you have to use your super, superpowers to make sure that they are calm and comfortable and relaxed when you're looking at the anterior chambers. If the child is particularly difficult or uncooperative, then you can try using a slit lamp, um, a portable slit lamp on the, on the mother's lap, um, but that can be difficult as well. I don't think you can see the cells that easily uh, in a child with a portable slit lamp as with a proper slit lamp. Remember that if you, if, you, if you do see, if you only see keratic precipitates in a child and you, don't, you can't convince yourself that, th that there are cells, then the keratic precipitates in themselves are a sign of activity. So it should alert you to the fact that there is active uveitis going on. In the worst case scenario, I've had to either uh, sedate the child to look in the ante to get a good look at, um, at the anterior chamber, or even do an examination under anesthesia in severe cases. But it's very important to be able to to examine the eyes in in in, in quite um, a lot of detail. So the next question is, do you use the paracentesis of the aqueous for PCR in cases of suspects, cases suspected of herpes or TB? So this is something which I find our adult uveitis colleagues do um, very regularly. They do PCR specimens um, of the aqueous for viral causes and and for and for toxoplasm and but I don't I don't find it particularly useful in my children and it's also quite an invasive test to do because you're not you don't want to do an intervention unnecessarily and very few of the children that present to my unit actually do have infective causes which is completely different from adults where the majority of, of adults with with severe uveitis often have a infective cause which needs to be investigated. Next question is, do you think the sun classification is enough or do we need a more accurate tool like flareometry? Well, I think if you've got flareometry, then, then you're very fortunate, but most of us um, don't have that facility available to us. So I think the, I, I do think the sun classification is, is, is good enough. Um, it's very difficult to remember, to remember um, the classification of by heart. So what I've done is I've, I've printed out and stick it on my notes board in my, in my examination room so you can refer to it and classify it accurately. And that's very important. The next question is, what is the characteristic appearance 
of the iris nodule for TB uveitis. Well, this was a child I saw at the end of last year, and she presented with um, mild symptoms, um, but she had an, an absolutely massive nodule in her iris, which we were wondering whether it might even be um, neoplastic. Um, but we did investigations for her, but it was just a huge, absolutely huge nod nodule in the iris stroma. It was not um, uh, on the margin or little or insignificant in any respect. It was just a massive nodule in the stroma of the iris. And she responded very well to anti tuberculous treatment. So the next question is, what is the most common cause of acute non-infectious hypopian iritis? So in my setting, as I mentioned earlier, the most common cause is post-streptococcal syndrome uveitis. They're the ones that present with an ac acutely painful red eye and a hypopian. And they are the ones that I would classify as typical post-streptococcal syndrome uveitis. uveitis. We hardly ever see beshades in kids or sarcoidosis in kids. I can, I can count on one hand the number of children I've seen with sarcoid related uveitis and HLA B27 associated iritis is uncommon in, in children in, in my setting. So a dense vitritis, um, a dense vitritis is when you have a lot of vitreous inflammation, so much so that you can't view the posterior pole. Um, and if the child has a cataract, you can pick up whether or not the vitreous is involved by doing a B scan and seeing if there's a lot of vitreous um, opacification and activity uh, in the vitreous. Um, but if a child does have dense vitritis, then it's unlikely that topical steroids will manage to control it. And then you need to start implementing a systemic treatment. A lot of uh, uh, patients wonder, uh, a lot of doctors wonder whether prostaglandin analogs are not contraindicated in uveitis. Um, I'm fairly relaxed about using them, to be honest. Um, I know that they can cause um, maculopathy and CMO in adults who have had complicated surgery but, and in diabetics, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy to use it um, when I'm stuck as far as the uh, glaucoma medication is concerned. The next question is, if you advise leaving the child a fake, do you advise a contact lens where after the post-op inflammation has subsided? Yes, ideally, if the child uh, manages, um, it tolerates a contact lens, then a contact lens will reduce the amount of anisocornea. Uh, um, <clears throat> but in some children, it's impossible to, um, to manage them with a contact lens, in which case, you have to use a fake expects, even though it's um, unilateral, and then try and patch them as best you can. But ideally, contact lenses would be your first or your first option. The next question is about how about using intracameral triamcinolone if you're not performing PPV at the same time. Um, I, I I presume. Intracameral triamcinolone is an option. Um, I wouldn't like to comment on that because I don't have much experience with that and I don't, I don't do that routinely. So IL cocooning is when you have a severe fibrotic reaction um, of the capsule around the, around the intraocular lens. You have dense um, posterior capsule opacification and anterior capsule phimosis and it contracts and just um, fibrosis the intraocular lens into, into a cocoon. And that is a particularly um, difficult situation to manage. And invariably, um, one needs to go in and take the whole IOL as well as the fibrotic capsule out. So this is a complication best avoided by, by not inserting an intraocular lens in a child with uveitis that's fully controlled. If you, do, if you do decide to use an RL, then I would always recommend using a Alcon Acrosoft lens. Um, they have the, most, the best track record in, 
in children. Okay, the next question is, how can we view the cyclic membrane? So there are two ways of doing this. The first is by um, UBM, if you're lucky enough to have it. And the second way is, is intraoperatively. So my vitre pediatric veterinal colleagues tend to approach the uveitic cataract from anteriorly, and they use the cutter and um, the aspiration to aspirate the, the cataract, and then they take the posterior capsule and introduce a light source into the anterior chamber. Sometimes you need iris hooks to pull the pupil out the way. And then they do deep indentation to, to look for cyclitic membranes before they, they place the ports for the PPV. And this is important because if you, if you place a port through a cyclitic membrane, then you can induce, induce retinal breaks, which are difficult to manage. So I've had a few children who have developed giant tears after, after you've had a cataract surgery and, and have needed silicone oil. So you've got to be very, very careful about where you put your ports if, you, if you're putting in um, ports for a PPV. Um, the next question is, do we follow the same treatment and follow-up guidelines in traumatic uveitis? No, well, traumatic uveitis is a completely different um, condition. And that does not usually um, become chronic and responds to the usual um, treatment with anti-inflammatories topically, like topical steroids for a few weeks. But it's not something which, which tends to become chronic and so uh, is usually self-resolving. The next statement is that it's difficult to rehabilitate with a contact lens in a young child. Which contact lens do you prefer? Um, it is difficult to rehabil rehabilitate a, a young child with a contact lens. We use um, soft contact lenses um, if we can um, in, in, in small children. Um, I think most of us have steered away from the use of hard contact lenses for um, pediatric cases, but whichever one you, you have available to you. And usually they, they um, soft uh, monthly, uh, three monthly contact lenses like still softs. So the next question is, um, how would you manage pre-op cataract in uveitis pediatric patients? So when you're planning surgery for these children, I usually bring them into my clinic a week before and give them an oral steroid pulse of one milligram per kilogram leading up to the surgery. And that you must sustain for a month post-op as well, just to make sure that the uveitis is, is preemptively controlled before you, you incite inflammation with your surgery. Some people say you should, you should wait for three months of quiescence before you attempt cataract surgery, <clears throat> but sometimes your hand is forced if you've got a child with bilateral cataracts and they're non-functional because the cataracts are so visually significant, in which case you need to intervene earlier, but just make sure that the child is, is very, very adequately immunosuppressed around the time of surgery when you do that. So again, which IOL do you prefer for UV to cat, uh, children cataract? As I said before, I'd be, I'd be very cautious about you using an IOL at all in children with UV to cataract. Be very, very cautious about UV, uh, using IOLs. They end up causing more um, trouble than help. So the next question is a good one. You have suggested a stage-wise stage -wise treatment plan can we use biologicals directly to avoid steroid complications? I think you have to be careful about using biologicals directly because they're not without risks in and, in of, in and of themselves. And also they're incredibly expensive. So I think it's, it's probably more prudent to have a stepwise approach. And remember, you're not gonna use steroids long-term. Systemic steroids, you're only gonna use for bridging purposes only and topical steroids you're going to use initially um, for the first six weeks or so, and then taper them down to a maximum of two drops a day, which are un unlikely to, to cause complications. 
What is the differential of iris nodules in children? Is it common? Um, no, iris nodules are not common in children, but often, often go um, hand in hand with granulomatous causes of, of inflammation in the eye. But that's something you can, you can read up about, it's, but it's not common. We see them occasionally. And the only TB nodule I, I saw, I, as I explained earlier, was a child who had a, a huge nodule in, in the stroma of the iris, which, which was um, spectacularly large. Um, we've had this question before. I'm quite relaxed about using pro prostaglandins in uveitis. Um, I think you've got to be more careful in adults who are more prone to cystoid macular edema. So this is a very important question. When st uh, steroid response starts, do you shift them to a weaker steroid? And the answer is no, definitely not. You have got to control the inflammation. That's your first priority is to make sure that the inflammation is under control. What you need to do when you have a steroid response is to start anti-glaucoma treatment um, and not, and not um, shift them to a weaker steroid. The inflammation needs to be controlled um, as your first priority. How much toxoplasma do you have? We see it occasionally. I can think of maybe three or four or five children I've, I've diagnosed with toxoplasma uveitis over the last five years. It's not common in our setting. And the last question is, is there any role of ketorolac in maintaining remission or preventing recurrence of anterior uveitis? And the, answer, the simple answer to that is no. Um, there's very little evidence to suggest non-steroidals have a role to play in the management of uveitis. So steer clear of them, if at all possible. Okay, I'll take one last question. In post-reprocultural arthritis, do you recommend you about the screening of those children? There are a lot here in Egypt. Um, no, we don't tend to screen um, the eyes of children with post streptococcal arthritis. Usually if they get post streptococcal uveitis, they present with an acutely painful red eye, plus or minus hypopian. Okay, folks, thanks for joining me.